Okay, so welcome everyone to this, I guess this year's final installment of the Ian Ramsey Centre Humane Philosophy Project seminar series. We're really grateful as always to the sponsors of this series, to the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion, the John Templeton Foundation, the Institute, or now I believe Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw, and to Blackfriars Hall, our delightful venue. We're really excited to welcome today Dr. Joanna Leidenhag, who is lecturer in theology and liberal arts at the University of Leeds. Joanna studied at Princeton Theological Seminary, did her PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Following that, she did postdoctoral research and served as a, a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews. She is author of the monograph, Minding Creation, Theological Panpsychism, and the Doctrine of Creation, which came out last year with Bloomsbury and with King T. Clark. And today she is going to talk to us about panpsychism and God brackets S. So please give me a, join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. It is a real honor um, to be with you today and to share some of this um, work and interest that I have um, in panpsychism and philosophy of religion. So panpsychism is the view that's both ancient and having a present day revival. Um, it's found in Eastern and Western philosophies, as we'll see a little bit of today. And it's the view that mind is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the universe. That's how I define it. Mind is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the universe. But the purpose of this talk is not to argue for the truth of panpsychism directly. Instead, what I want to do for you is to review the number of ways that panpsychism has been used in philosophy of religion, and specifically how it's been used to construct different models of God, or lack thereof in the case of atheism. However, we'll see even in the case of atheism, panpsychism can be used as an attempt to satisfy the religious temperament. And I think, therefore, it's fair to say from the outset that as a theory about consciousness, about the mind, panpsychism is undeniably of religious significance, even if that religious significance is fairly malleable. So one of the things I most want to argue for today is that panpsychism is theologically flexible. And that's because panpsychism has been really strongly associated with particular models of God and not others. And I think this is a mistake. So I want to stress this flexibility. That said, it's not quite correct to say that when it comes to panpsychism and belief in God or gods, just anything goes. You can do whatever you like. Um, what I also want to show in this paper is that different types of panpsychism pair up with different ideas about God in complex ways. Sometimes the pairing between the idea about God and the idea about the mind um, in, is a very strong connection, something even close to a logical entailment. But most of the time, or at least some of the time, it's a much weaker sort of connection, so a structural similarity or perhaps just a fittingness. That if this is your model of God, then it's fitting that this is your model of consciousness. So that's roughly the sorts, that's with the argument I want to make today. Um, but before we go any further, I should give you a bit more detail about what panpsychism is. So, uh, most simply, panpsychism, right? The general claim pan, all things have psyche or some kind of mentality. As I've already said, and just re repetition is good, right? So as I've already said, panpsychism is a family of views that says that the mind is fundamental and ubiquitous throughout the universe or throughout reality, if your reality is bigger than the universe. To claim that mentality is fundamental, is the first key claim, is to say that the mind cannot be explained in terms of or reduced to anything non-mental. So by saying that the mind is fundamental, panpsychists are distancing themselves from uh, various forms of physicalism, those who claim that the mind can be reduced to the physical. They're also distancing themselves from many forms of emergentism to claim that minds can arise out of 
um, the non-mental, um, through behavior or through structural complexity. So by saying mind is fundamental, they're ruling out physicalism and emergentism. But it was pointed out to me when I used to define panpsychism as just the claim that mind is fundamental, that substance dualists could say that minds are fundamental. And panpsychists certainly don't typically want to be associated with substance dualists. So I think we need to add the claim that the mind is also ubiquitous throughout the universe for panpsychists, and really capturing that pan bit of the, of the original word. But that said, um, panpsychism can be interpreted in a fairly dualistic way. So even when you uh, subscribe to panpsychism, this family of views, um, what else exists is, a, is, a, is an open question. Oh, wrong keyboard. So, sorry, that's the definition to keep it up there for you so you can see it. And then um, we've said something about the mind, but, but what else exists is still perhaps a question. So panpsychism could be a bit more dualistic. It could be a kind of dualism all the way down. Everything could be like a Cartesian dualism, right? That, that could be a form of panpsychism. Um, or it could be more monistic. So either that the world um, is made of one kind of stuff, but that stuff is both mental and physical, psychophysical stuff. Or you could be an idealist panpsychist, that there's only the stuff that exists is mind stuff, mental stuff, and there's no other physical stuff. And panpsychists differ on this matter. Right? But whether panpsychism is best articulated in a dualist, dual aspect monist, or idealist fashion isn't the only issue that panpsychists disagree with. And what I'm trying to show you here is really what I mean by it's a family of views rather than just one strict view. So there are other questions that panpsychists debate amongst themselves. Um, how should we understand this mentality that's fundamental and ubiquitous? What is the fundamental level of reality? And um, how do fundamental minds, however the first two questions are answered, um, relate to human minds? And as I've said, one of the purposes of this paper is to show that how a panpsychist answers this question doesn't necessarily determine, but it does constrain um, what kinds of model of God that you can then pair this with. So each of these questions, apart from the first one, which I've already said has three answers, I think that's the next, um, but the others mostly have two answers, two types of broad answers that we can point to. Um, so in order to show how the pairing works, I'll, I'll briefly explain each of these. So when it comes to what is meant by mentality, question two on the screen, um, you can either, so first of all, almost all panpsychists in history, there are one or two slightly embarrassing exceptions, but almost all panpsychists say that we're not talking about anything like a human mind. Right? We're not talking about rationality, we're not talking about self-consciousness, we're not talking about emotions, um, we're not talking about rocks that have existential crises. Um, but there's still disagreement about what we are talking about and how much we can really say about the mentality, the, 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 the quality of experience had by fundamental minds. Um, Leibniz uses the language of prolonged unconsciousness, um, a profound dreamless sleep, a state of stupor, when he's talking about his monads, who we'll, we'll come back to it towards the end of this paper. And this language is helpful because it undercuts the fixation we have with human self-conscious rationality, but I think it's probably even still too anthropomorphic. Um, to use language of, of Thomas Nagel, we simply cannot know what it's like to be an electron or to be the universe or to be just about anything other than human, really. So some panpsychists still think that basic subjectivity is too much to posit. So some will go with basic subjects that we can't really explain. That's subjective panpsychism or subject panpsychism. And some will say that even subjectivity is too much to, to talk about. So it's pan-proto, you know, proto-psychism, not quite psyche yet. Proto-phenomenality. Phenomenality. Um, and so we'll see some examples of that later too. Okay, the next question, um, what do we mean by fundamental in panpsychism? And this question is probably the most significant when it comes to pairing panpsychism with models of God. 
So the main disagreement is micropsychism, as in the fundamental reality is the basic building blocks, atoms, electrons, whatever it is that physicists end up telling us is the most basic building blocks. This might not be small at the end of the day. It might be quite large things um, spatial spatially, but um, basic building blocks. And then the other option is cosmopsychism, which is the statement that um, really what's most fundamental is the universe taken as a single whole. That really what that exists fundamentally is one thing. And that everything else is a part or derived from that one thing. Um, and that is cosmopsychism. Um, so it's fundamentally consciousness is applied to the cosmos as a whole. You can already, I'm sure, see some of the religious connotations that are going to be coming out of that view. And finally, um, to the fourth question, um, panpsychism, at least within philosophy of mind, and it is used elsewhere, such as in eco-philosophy and, and other areas of philosophy in a different way, but in philosophy of mind, its main purpose is to try and explain human consciousness. And so to do that, um, there has to be an account of the relationship between fundamental minds and human minds. And again, there are two broad camps that we could identify. There's constitutive panpsychism, where fundamental minds um, constitute entirely human consciousness, such that human consciousness is nothing over and above the sum of the fundamental minds that make it up. Just like we might say a car is nothing really over and above a particular arrangement of parts arranged car-wise. And the hope for constitutive panpsychism is that it will be able to maintain causal closure and avoid the interaction problem that faces dualism, but still explain mental physical causation, or rather it will be one thing, mental physical causation would be one and the same effectively. And the second option is non-constitutive panpsychism, so that's everyone who denies the constitutive model. Um, such that human minds are made up of fundamental minds, but there's something over and above, something that perhaps emerges in a weaker sense, um, something that a result, uh, appears as a result of fission, perhaps, um, such that we might still preserve free will, even whilst um, having a panpsychist model. Okay, so there's the, the hopes and the reasons for those two models and what they roughly, very roughly mean. So I could say a lot more about all the variants. If you think about, we've got um, four questions here with multiple answers. There's lots of options to pair these with, to, to, to create different specific types of panpsychism. Um, but I'm not going to go into any more detail about that. Instead, I'm going to um, use this very light sketch that I've given you in order to consider how panpsychism pairs um, with belief in God or gods or lack of. So we'll start with the lack of when there is no God or gods. So in 1979, analytic philosopher Thomas Nagel published an essay simply entitled Panpsychism. But more clearly than ever before, I think, he presented this idea and he um, defined panpsychism as, I quote, the basic constituents of the universe have mental properties. Um, and he presented this as a plausible theory without any religious connotations at all or any big metaphysical system. It was really stripped down bare. And Nagel's basic argument was that if we accept that humans are made from one type of stuff, we call that matter, um, and that we accept that consciousness is undeniably real, because I experience it at the very least, um, and if we accept, third premise, that consciousness is irreducible or, and cannot emerge out of matter, then the only remaining option is panpsychism. So he presented a kind of um, uh, argument by exclusion. Um, it's just the old last man standing argument. He still didn't think it was a very good one, by the way. He kind of ended with, this is really implausible, but I cannot see a way out of it type, type argument. Um, now, of course, there is another option that Nagel didn't consider in that paper, and that's to invoke supernatural divine action to explain consciousness in the universe. Um, Nagel just doesn't think of that as an option on the table. But one way to interpret the recent revival in panpsychism, in analytic philosophy specifically, that really started off 
as a small snowball effect out of Nagel's paper, um, is um, an awareness that if we want to keep divine action out of explanations of consciousness, we might need to do something fairly radical and counterintuitive. So I think there's that kind of um, naturalistic and atheistic impulse in, in some of the revival of panpsychism. And we can see this as one of the main motivations. So there we, so there's Thomas Nagel. Um, we can see this as one of the main motivations for the second figure who's really popularized panpsychism, um, David J. Chalmers. And Chalmers writes that he is motivated by a desire to take consciousness seriously um, so that it can't be reduced to physical functioning. But he also wants to take science seriously um, as the best and perhaps even only real way of understanding the world. Um, so Chalmers adopts a fairly reductionist and unificationist picture of natural science and tries to fit mentality into that reductionist picture of natural science um, by saying that um, mentality is one of the fundamental entities connected by fundamental laws, and we can explain it just like we explain all other fundamental entities connected by fundamental laws. That's the hope, anyway. He knows we're not there yet, but that's what he would like. Um, and he's very keen to emphasize when he does this, he calls it naturalistic dualism. And he's very keen to emphasize that there's, and I quote, nothing particularly spiritual or mystical in his position. And in a later book, he writes, there's nothing especially transcendent, transcendental about consciousness. It's just another natural phenomenon. To embrace dualism is not necessarily to embrace mystery. So I draw those out to really show you how this panpsychism is functioning for Chalmers as a way to keep mystery, theism, and religion at bay in discussions about consciousness. But as, we, as panpsychism continues to be talked about in analytic philosophy, so um, Nagel's essay was uh, seven, 1979, David Chalmers' two, two books that I just quoted from were 1996 and 1997, um, and so Quite a lot has happened in panpsychism and analytic philosophy since then. And I think we've seen actually a softening, even amongst um, analytic philosophers who still identify as atheists, we still see a softening towards religiosity. And I think this is in two different ways. And the first way um, that it's been softened is by David Chalmers, um, by Galen Strawson, and by um, the third figure I'll put up here, um, Philip Goff. Um, and the way that it's been reduced is that because of the difficulty of explaining how minds could come together, to how little minds, fundamental minds, might come together to create a complex mind like a human one, um, they are turning away from the micro-psychism that starts off with this small building up picture and turning instead towards cosmo-psychism as perhaps more helpful in explaining um, the relationship between fundamental mind and human minds. Um, and in so doing, the immediate question that arises, if a philosopher says there's a cosmic mind, I think it's perfectly natural to say, well, do you call it God? Right? It's an almost inevitable question that they have to consider. Um, and Goff in 2017 clearly states that his cosmopsychism does not entail pantheism because the consciousness of the universe is simply a mess. Right? It's not anything personal or agential or coherent. Similarly, um, Galen Strawson says um, in a 2020 paper that if, if there is a cosmic subject, which he's kind of argued for the whole paper that there probably is, so <laughs> um, if there is a cosmic subject, it wouldn't, I think, be any sort of agent. Right? So he, again, is trying to distance himself from any kind of God picture, even as their position is clearly opening up for that and pushing them in that direction. The second route um, within atheism that's softening towards religiosity is, um, I keep pressing it, is uh, Thomas Nagel's route, but has also again been taken more recently by Philip Goff. Um, and this is um, from Nagel's concern that uh, even after he has ruled out belief in traditional theism in any way, he still recognizes um, what he calls the religious temperament within humanity. Um, 
And what he, he writes, so um, the question, what am I doing here, Nagel writes, doesn't just go away when science replaces a religious worldview. It's still a question that needs answering. And what he wants is a view of the world that can play a certain role in his inner life. Again, that's a quote. Play a role in his inner life. He wants to feel connected. He wants to live in harmony with the universe. And Nagel wonders in his book, The Religious Temperament, if there is and can be a secular alternative to theism that can fill this need he has. And in his next book, published two years later, a very famous book, Mind and Cosmos, um, he seems to answer in the affirmative to this question, and he uses panpsychism to do so. Um, if we compare the two treatments of panpsychism that Nagel gives us, one from 1979 and one from 2012, and we see that he becomes far more ambitious. Right? 1979 is a stripped back argument for panpsychism. Um, in 2012, he argues that the mind body problem, and I quote, is not just a local problem for humanity, but it's a problem that invades our entire understanding of the cosmos and history. He thinks the mind body problem is a, is a universal problem in that kind of scope. So panpsychism then becomes for Nagel not just a way to build conscious organisms like humans out of conscious molecules or conscious atoms, it becomes a way to re-enchant the universe with natural teleology um, and intrinsic meaning. To be clear, Nagel does not think that panpsychism and teleology are incompatible with theism, but he's using panpsychism to fill the existential and explanatory void that's left when belief in God is ruled out a priori. Um, Philip Goff has recently embraced the potential of the religious implications of his panpsychism. Um, just one year after the last quote I gave you in, in, tw in 2018, um, he started to speculate on how panpsychism might be connected to mystical experiences of various religious traditions, might help us with the problem of cosmic fine-tuning, and might even provide a basis for morality. Um, However, if Goff merely calls his universal consciousness um, God, then his view, interestingly, isn't really pantheism or panentheism. It's more like the reverse. It's, a, we might say, theo en pan or something, right? It's God in everything, but, but the everything is more than the God, right? The, every, the pan, the universe, is bigger than God. God's just one bit of the universe. Um, and as Goff writes, on such a view... God slash universal consciousness is an aspect of the physical universe, but the physical universe is not exhausted by God. It's kind of bizarre, interesting, fairly novel view, I would have it. But Goff's panpsychism, like Nagel's, even though it doesn't really give us a very clear picture of a God, a model of God, that's why I've just about put him in the atheist category, though I'm not sure he really belongs there. Um, the reason he's there is because they're both... Um, trying to fill a void. So Goff speaks of the cosmic alienation of a secular worldview. And he writes um, at the end of his popular um, Galileo's Error in 2019, he writes, um, on the panpsychist view, the universe is like us and we belong to it. Panpsychism can help humans once again feel that they have a place in the universe. Right, so you you can see that he's really trying to um, fill that spiritual void here. But we've already um, introduced how a cosmopsychism is evoking at least the question of whether or not it entails pantheism or panentheism. And certainly the most straightforward way to pair up panpsychism um, with any model of God is to say that mentality is identical to divinity, the two words are the same thing, and boom, you get probably a pantheism. The claim that everything is God becomes synonymous with the claim that everything is mental, although everything is mental is obviously idealism, but we're getting close enough. This is what Yuji Nagasagwa has proposed for the relationship between panpsychism and philosophy of religion. But I think it's rather hasty 
um, for a couple of reasons. So one is that there are at least as many versions of pantheism as I've already said there are of panpsychism. Um, everything, God, is, if we take those three words to be the key terms in pantheism, can all be defined in subtly different ways. And contemporary pantheist Michael Levine notes that pantheism and panpsychism, and I quote, do not entail one another. The suggestion that pantheism and panpsychism naturally go together is vague apart from specific accounts of the two positions. And I think he's right about that. We've already seen that some panpsychists just flat out deny that their, in, their view entails a pantheism. But for those who want to interpret their panpsychism in a pan pantheistic fashion, I still think it's important to bear in mind Michael Levine's warning because not every version of pantheism is compatible with every version of panpsychism. So I'll discuss um, the three main ways that panpsychism has been related to pantheism. The most minimal correspondence is seen in a materialistic pantheism. So this is a view that adopts a materialist ontology wholly lacking in consciousness and subjectivity um, and still uses God language to refer to the sacredness of the universe to try and um, motivate it mostly purely semantically. But how could a materialistic pantheism possibly be combined with a panpsychism? Well, in one sense, it's a bit of a word game. Um, certainly, we might draw, and I've already mentioned Galen Strawson, and he's most famous for arguing for panpsychism as realistic materialism, as he calls it. Um, and he does this by appealing to the inscrutability of matter. He says, we don't really know what matter is, so how do we know that it's not mental? It's kind of playing word games. Um, we also would need, if you're going to do this type of pantheism with panpsychism, um, you'd probably need to adopt pran proto-psychism, right? That sense that that's not quite mental stuff. It's not quite subjectivity or consciousness. It's something prior to that that we're not saying is entirely physical either, right? Something a bit unknown. And if you do these two things, um, as one philosopher today um, at the University of Saskatchewan has done, Carl Pfeiffer, then you might be able to create a materialistic pantheism with your panpsychism. So Pfeiffer, um, uses pan-intentionalism, so that's a type of pattern, proto-psychism. He says that the universe is like the brain of God, and God is not like a soul, but just the mass term uh, for the stuff of the universe. Um, I think the resulting picture is a fairly robust account of a pantheism um, that he's aiming for, but it's barely a form of panpsychism. It maybe just about qualifies. By far the more well-known way to combine panpsychism and pantheism is um, in the work of the philosopher Barak Spinoza. There's no two ways about it. Spinoza was a panpsychist and Spinoza was a pantheist. Moreover, Spinoza's pantheism entails, or frankly just is, a form of panpsychism. So for Spinoza, there's one infinite eternal, necessary, fundamental substance, which he calls both God or nature. Um, so Spinoza's pantheism is radically monistic. God slash nature is self-creating through thought, and in thinking about itself, it extends itself physically. So in this way, Spinoza's pantheism entails something like a dual aspect cosmopsychism. For Spinoza, thought and extension are the same activity. They're just two ways that we have for describing what the one substance is doing when it's thinking about itself. So in this sense, Spinoza's already a, a panpsychist. He's a panpsychist in another sense as well, though, because um, he views the ideas that God slash nature has when it's thinking about itself as minds. So every idea is not just an object and something that the one mind is thinking about. It's also in and of itself a mind as well because it is the mind that's thinking about itself. Gets a bit tricky to say. Um, but every cabbage, star, or grain of sand for Spinoza is also a mind, therefore. So we note that on Spinoza's 
uh, view, his pantheism and panpsychism are actually the same, the same thing. There's not much divinity in, in, in traditional senses going on here. It's just his language for describing fundamental and ubiquitous consciousness to overcome various kinds of dualism. That's his motivation. And we'll see that this same basic motivation to overcome various kinds of dualism um, is one of the main drivers that any, any pan, panentheist or pantheist turns to panpsychism. It's this drive to try and overcome Cartesian dualism. The final um, pantheist school I want to look at um, is um, Avanta Vedanta in Indian philosophy. Um, they're not always happy with the label pantheist, and I want to acknowledge that, um, but it's certainly monistic um, and radically idealist. So, um, uh, Adi Shrank... Sh oh, my goodness. <laughs> I did practice these. Okay. Sankara... Um, Shankara? Shankara, there we are, um, gave a monistic reading to the Vedic canon, um, which clearly has a soteriological goal, mushka, spiritual liberation, um, and it identifies a personal uh, Brahma as God, as well as there being an impersonal um, Brahma behind that. Um, um, and uh, Brahmas the, of gods, which is called Isvara, manifestations are objects of worship and daily devotion. So I, I say this out because even though they're not always happy, or not all commentators are happy with the language of pantheism, I do. Th it is a religious worldview. It's not just a, a metaphysic, right? It's got soteriological and devotional and piety goals to it, and, orient and really orientation. So a number of contemporary authors have sought to explore the connection between the recent movement in analytic panpsychism and the uh, Avaidanta Vedanta um, philosophies to investigate particularly whether this ancient Indian tradition can help contemporary philosophers uh, resolve things like their combination problem that I was talking about earlier. So Shankara's monism holds that Brahman alone is real and um, the absolute and impersonal Brahman is a tranquil consciousness undisturbed by any differences. And there's a metaphysical unity between the self, the Atman, and Brahman. So Brahman is Atman, and Atman is Brahman, is perhaps the central most maxim of this tradition, of the Ad Avantans. So uh, Avaita Vedanta is uh, interpreted as a cosmopsychist position, right? There's one fundamental cosmic mind, and this explains the appearance of human consciousness. But the key difference to contemporary analytic philosophers is that to Shankara, the cosmos and all the subjects therein are in fact mithya. They are neither real nor non-real. Um, they are illusionary. So, in fact, there's nothing to be explained by the combination problem. Um, such an attempt to explain human consciousness can only be the product of ignorance. So the goal of Shankara's philosophy is not to explain consciousness. It's to liberate us from the illusion of individuality and the even thought that we would want to explain it. So we can see um, in these three pantheistic visions of panpsychism a strong tendency towards not just cosmopsychism, but constitutive cosmopsychism, right? Um, that there's very little difference, that the human mind doesn't really exist over and above in any causal or, or real sense, um, the fundamental mind, however that's conceived. And this is because of the importance of unity for pantheism. So it's not enough for a pantheist to say that everything is divine, because you could find a way to say that if everything is a divine individual, and then you get something closer to a polytheism. Um, instead, pantheism has to hold that the world is an all-inclusive divine unity. It's one world, one God that's one thing. Um, and this all-inclusive unity within the world and between the world and God means that pantheists who embrace panpsychism, um, which most do, are constrained to adopt a constitutive and a cosmopsychist view or form of panpsychism. Okay, let's move on to panentheism. So 
panentheism, as I'm sure many of you know, um, seeks a middle path between claiming that God is separate from the world, um, as traditional theists do, and that God is the world, like pantheists do. They're trying to find a way between these two claims by saying that, every, that the world exists in God, but God is more than the world. But several philosophers have noted that panentheism has astonishing structural similarities. Um, that's a quote from our friend Goodhart Bundrup. Um, but, so there's st st astonishing structural similarities with panpsychism and panentheism because neither are exactly mono mon monisms and neither of them exactly dualisms. There's something in between. Um, and indeed, it's this structural similarity that means that uh, panpsychism is often seen as a, as a good way to articulate divine imminence. And it's this need to articulate divine imminence that often motivates panentheists to adopt panpsychism. And yet, as with pantheism, not all types of panpsychism are amenable to panentheists. They have to pick and choose carefully. If panentheists want to use panpsychism to express divine imminence, by claiming that fundamental consciousness can be identified with a single omnipresent divine being, then cosmopsychism, again, will be more attractive than micropsychism. But if panentheists are to coherently differentiate their position from the pantheists who we just learned about, and I want to note that actually not everyone thinks that's necessary. Quite a lot of pantheists and panentheists think their positions are the same. Um, I don't understand that, but I should note that that is a strong position in the literature. Um, then if a panentheist wants to differentiate themselves from pantheism, they'll need to adopt a non-constitutive relationship between the fundamental consciousness, which they also identify as God, and individual subjects. And in this section, we also have uh, three views to quickly look at to show this how this works in historical form. So um, we have a uh, more modern interpreter of Shankara, um, Samkara, um, uh, yeah, so the main uh, person who brought uh, Adha Vedanta over to the West, Swami Vivekananda. Um, we also will look at process theism of Alfred Knott Whitehead and two more explicitly Christian forms of panentheism as well in Sergei Bulakov and Teilhard de Chardin, all very quickly. So, um, first, uh, Swami Vivekananda, uh, an Indian monk, as I said, credited with introducing Hinduism and Vedanta philosophy to the West. Um, he offers a panentheistic cosmopsychism by combining two different Indian schools. So, he combines um, Samkhya's dualist philosophy with the radical monism we've already seen in Ava Vedanta. So, like Shankara, who we looked at, Vivekananda uses Brahman, sees Brahman as the one universal consciousness, um, having both the kind of apophatic, impersonal, perfect, tranquil consciousness, and a more cataphatic, personal God that we can be the object of devotion and piety. But following his guru, uh, Shiri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda argues that the Avadantan position, the negation of the world as pure illusion, is only the first stage of true liberation. He says that there is then a second stage when you realize that all things are not just illusions, but are real manifestations of Brahman. So um, contemporary philosopher and Ramakrishna monk, Aeon Maharaj, describes this position which he follows um, and helpfully writes about in English um, as a cosmopsychist panentheism because all things are a manifestation of Brahman, the universal consciousness, but they do not exhaust Brahman. Brahman is more than her, and that pronoun is deliberate, manifestations in the world. Okay. In Western philosophy, perhaps the most worked out and famous panentheist, panpsychist, is Whiteheadian process philosophy. Whitehead wanted to overcome Cartesian dualism by conceiving of the world with no arbitrary breaks between mind and matter. And to do this, Whitehead posited that the final real things of which the world are made are drops of experience, 
complex and independent, together forming an ocean of feeling. So Whitehead's panpsychism is not really subject panpsychism, it's a pan-experientialism. There aren't subjects, um, there are just moments of experience flashing in and out. Um, but it's also a um, micro psychism because there's lots of individual moments of experience that form societies together that form objects that we can perceive and are bigger, like us. Um, Whitehead identifies God in his system as the principle of limitation. As such, um, God, or the principle of limitation, has three main functions. So first, God creates the world by envisioning and actualizing eternal objects, which make the otherwise indeterminate primordial soup determinate and concrete. And that's God's first function. Um, God's second function is that God guarantees that there's an afterlife because as each actual occasion flashes in and out of existence, um, it passes into the being of God, um, into the divine life, and is remembered by God and so immortalized. And third, um, God, for Whitehead, guides the world in a kind of providential mode um, towards goodness by luring actual occasions um, towards the good. Um, and just as each occasion of experience influences those around it, so God is affected and constrained by each, occasional ex each occasion of experience as it passes into God's life. Right, so God is famously not omnipotent in process theism. And whilst panentheism um, was coined by the German panpsychist, who I haven't really considered here, Carl Christian Friedrich Krauss, it was popularized in English language philosophy by Whitehead's most famous student, Charles Hartsthorne. Um, and this is because, um, as contemporary process philosopher David Ray Griffin describes, um, in process thought, and I quote, what exists necessarily is not God alone, but God and the world as a single metaphysical system. So the world is therefore said to be in God, but God is more than the world. Though it's worth noting that on a process view, you could also say that God is in the world and the world is more than God. It's, they, they, you, could, you can talk about it both ways. So process theologians, as opposed to process philosophers, say, um, employ Whiteheadian metaphysics to specifically elucidate Christian doctrine. But being a process theologian isn't the only way to be a Christian and a panpsychist, or even a Christian and a panpsychist and a panentheist. We can see other examples of this combination. And here, um, there are two. Um, so on the top of the screen is um, Russian Orthodox theologian and philosopher Sergei Bulakov, and on the bottom is the French Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Um, Bulakov and Teilhard introduce um, a more eschatological perspective on their panentheism. That is that the panpsychist world will be, will be taken up into the divine being and will therefore become panentheist in a way that it is not currently as a result of sin and the fall. And so we might even um, call their position uh, panentheosis, rather than just a panentheism in general. Um, Bulakov's panpsychist panentheism is, constri is constructed around his uh, Sophie sophiology, his idea about the divine Sophia. Um, Sophia is, for Bulakov, the divine Uziah. It is a subsistent divine life, and it is the divine world, as he calls it. But it is also alive and conscious. It is, in fact, consciousness. It contains within it all the ideas in the sense of platonic forms that then ground creation. Um, and so this conscious living divine Sophia is the fundamental ground of creation. And so thus we get a kind of panpsychism. Interestingly, a panpsychism here that is also tied with an affirmation of creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. Um, Teilhard de Chardin takes his pantheosis um, in a more explicitly um, Christian direction in that he uses the term pan-Christism, -Christ pan-Christism. 
or the Christification of the universe. Um, both Bulakov and Teilhard are, in fact, deeply anthropocentric in the way that they're constructing their panpsychisms and their panentheisms, um, because it's that all creation is destined to become human, effectively, or like the human, insofar as the human is conscious and material, so should all creation be. And, of course, they use Jesus as the divine human, as um, the basis for this. And this Christological vision um, of, de of a deified creation was, of course, famously combined with Teilhard's enthusiasm for evolutionary theory. So Teilhard took the continuity of evolution um, to be an argument for panpsychism, just as contemporary philosophers often do. So he wrote, we are logically forced to assume the existence in, rudiment, in some rudimentary form of some sort of psyche in every corpuscle, even those whose complexity is of such low or modest order as to render it imperceptible. So he says, just if, if evolution is smooth and there are no breaks, then the consciousness we see up here has to find some rudimentary form down there. Right? It's a common argument for panpsychism. Um, he even described the process of evolution as the movement of consciousness veiled in morphology. So he thought consciousness was driving evolution to some extent, as a great law of consciousness, he called it. So that is, panpsychism allows and is the tool by which Teilhard interprets evolution as a divine mechanism for the deification of creation, just to show how important the panpsychism is to him. So we are moving on to our very last group, the traditional monotheists. So when panpsychism is combined with pantheism or panentheism, it's often because, as I said at the beginning of the pantheism section, consciousness is taken to be equivalent to, or at least in continuity with, divinity, right? Mental stuff is divine stuff, roughly. Um, but in traditional theism, consciousness, souls, and minds are created, just like matter's created, just like angels are created, right? Um, so it's perfectly possible to be a panpsychist and a traditional theist, though often in the literature, both the theistic literature and in the panpsychist literature, this is seen as to be just an impossible position, and I, I think that's utterly bizarre because there are loads of traditional theists in history that are also panpsychists. And my favourite historical example um, is this man, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. And, and one of the reasons he's my favourite is because he's one of the most explicit panpsychists in all of history, of all of the people that we've looked at. There's no getting around that Leibniz is a panpsychist. He's also a really hardcore classical theist who goes right to the um, kind of high point of a, of a classical traditional theism, much in line um, with Aquinas's and even more rationalistic, perhaps, again. Don't ask me about that, Aquinas scholars in the room. <laughs> um, so unlike the pantheists and the panentheists I just outlined, Leibniz's mode, mode, monadology is deeply micro-psychist version of panpsychism. So monads for Leibniz are a substance which is truly one. They're unities. Um, and they have experiential centers, um, which he called sub substantial forms. And the substantial form is a soul in humans and in animals, anything with a memory. He calls it a soul. If it's not got a memory, it's called enchilechi, such as in insects and plants. So monads have two properties for Leibniz. Um, appetition, which... Uh, is a striving that drives the behavior of the monad throughout its existence in a pre-established behavior, right? There's no causation for Leibniz. Um, and perception. And it's perception um, that is the key for the consciousness part that we're interested in, really. But what I want to draw attention to is that perception for, of each monad for Leibniz, he suggests, is like a mirror of of the whole world, of the whole universe, each from its own special point of view. That's a quote. Um, and the, the collection of monads therefore creates um, an increased amount of reflection and light into this beautiful kind of 
cathedral of ever-reflecting um, light and colors that is filled with the glory of God. And so nowhere for Leibniz is, anywhere in the universe is, the, is creation fallow or sterile or dead. All space, because this is actually his account of space, is filled with monads, each of which is unique um, and together forms a plenum of living creatures throughout the universe filled filled with, to the max, as it were, think of a baked bean can, filled with baked beans, um, filled to the max with subjects, with monads. Um, so it's clear that Leibniz is a panpsychist, um, but how does he relate his panpsychism to his doctrine of God? That's kind of the question we need to dig into. So Leibniz's God is bound up with his commitment to the principle of sufficient reason. The principle of sufficient reason is, and I quote him for this, we hold that there can be no real, there can be no fact, real or existing, no statement true, unless there be a sufficient reason why it be so and not otherwise, although these reasons usually cannot be known to us. So God for Leibniz is the ultimate reason for everything. And this for him means that God created the universe ex nihilo, out of a free rational choice, and he's the reason why we can say that the universe exists. But what, what's God's sufficient reason, then, for a universe of monads? Leibniz sets himself up to need to be able to answer that question. And his answer, I think, is um, surprising, and it just goes to show how you can incorporate panpsychism into a really traditional monotheism. He says... Um, that it is in conformity with the greatest and beautiful works of God that he would produce as many substances as, as there could be in the universe. It is a perfection of nature to have many souls. And as I've already said, through perception, the infinite number of monads that Leibniz envisions is, because it is infinite, um, creates a greater light, the mirror blending the light, not only in the individual eye, but also amongst each other, so that the gathering splendor produces glory. So clearly Leibniz's motivation for a panpsychist universe is that it is the universe that to him gives most glory to its transcendent creator. In my own work, I've built a bit on Leibniz's argument by incorporating um, biblical and liturgical texts that speak of creation glorifying God, the mountains declaring the wonders of God and the animals. Uh, prophetic and wisdom literature in the Hebrew Bible and even a few places in, Christian, in the Christian New Testament depict nature as having a voice. Now, clearly these texts are poetic, but they're not merely poetic. That is, they are not without reference in the real world. And I think Psalm 19 um, captures this simultaneous metaphorical and realistic claim that nature actively praises God quite well. So Psalm 19 uh, reads... The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day it pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are they words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out throughout the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So given that the mountains and the stars and the trees do not have voice boxes, <laughs> it's unsurprising that some of nature's elocution is depicted in the Hebrew Bible in non-anthropomorphic verbs. The earth speaks by quaking. The oceans praise by roaring. In Jeremiah 12, verse 4, the land is said to mourn in a word that can equally be translated as dry up or grow black. These descriptions then are in keeping with responses expected from the natural world, but that's not to suggest that we can't interpret them as speech acts. And this idea has been picked up by Rowan Williams um, when he writes, the bare fact is that the material world speaks. Williams extends the evolutionary grounds for human language deep into our embodied connection with the material world because, and I quote him again, Material objects and the material world are, as such, always and already saturated with mind. 
The place, therefore, of fundamental mentality in theology, in this traditional theism, which I would advocate for, is not to try and construct a model of God out of panpsychism, in fact, but it is to see panpsychism as a creaturely community, perhaps even a cosmic church that worships God together. So let me try and sum up all that I have said for you. So there's the four sections that we went through, so you can remind yourself. So whilst I've not really directly argued for the truth of panpsychism in this paper, I hope I have shown that it's a view that deserves to be taken seriously, and particularly taken seriously by people interested in theology and philosophy of religion. Ancient and contemporary thinkers from a wide variety of global um, traditions have felt that they've needed to explain human consciousness by positing mentality um, as a fundamental and ubiquitous attribute of the world. But panpsychism is not one view, it's a family of views, and like all families, there are disagreements, differences. Put most simply, panpsychists agree that everything contains psyche, but everything and psyche can be, dif um, and the relationship between everything and psyche um, are points of disagreement. What this paper sought to do is show how the different versions of panpsychism relate to the different models of God um, the, the big ones, as it were, um, atheism, pantheism, panentheism, and traditional monotheism. There were few, maybe one or two, um, logical entailments here, um, but most of the time, uh, what we found were some more loose um, structural similarities or arguments from fittingness. We can get logical entailments if we make that prior assumption that mentality is divinity then you can get some fine-grained pairings up of panpsychism and pantheism or panentheism. But um, you first have to make that, I think, quite questionable identification in order to do that work. Instead, what I hope I've shown is that panpsychism is theologically really flexible um, in its position. Its role within large religious systems depends both on the form of panpsychism that's adopted and on other commitments and assumptions that are made and brought to the table. But if mentality is created such that humanity stands in deep solidarity with other in-minded creatures and God remains radically transcendent, then what I want to leave you with is the message that there's no reason that panpsychism cannot be combined with tra tra traditional Christianity or other forms of monotheism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joanna, for that really, really interesting talk. Uh, I thought it was particularly uh, interesting that we kind of think of uh, illusionism about human-level consciousness as the last refuge to which materialists cling. And yet, uh, ironically, the uh, classical version appears in a form of uh, Advaita Vedanta pantheist. I mean, Daniel Dennett would be horrified to learn this. Uh, um, we do have uh, some time for Q&A now. Uh, as I said, we are filming the Q&A, so if you'd allow Mikawai to bring you the microphone, deliver your question into it, and that way it will be captured on our recording equipment. It won't make you louder. Uh, so, uh, perhaps we'll go from the front, Andrew, Herb, uh, and then maybe at the back. I want to say thank you. That was a, a very good, clear introduction. It will serve as an introduction of all kinds of students, so uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm curious about the, about angels because um, angels are supposed to be created beings, uh, but and have minds, um, but they're not linked to materialities, which raised a question in my mind: uh, Is panpsychism is the mind bit? Does it always have to be linked to some material reality? Yeah, good good question. Um, I would be comfortable with two answer, two different types of answers. I don't have a strong opinion on angels. Um, but I think what you could say is either that angels have a consciousness like us which is linked to a type of ma materiality, but it's just not this type of materiality. So you could say they have subtle bodies or some other kind of bodies, right? Or you could say that their consciousness is not like our consciousness and therefore doesn't have to be um, linked to any form of materiality. 
So just to follow up, though, on the second option, would that no longer be part of panpsychism? Or is panpsychism an infinitely flexible church? <laughs> no, I, um, no, so I think... Oh. So you could be an idealist panpsychist who thinks that only mental things exist. Okay. So then you could do that way. I don't think that. I'm more of a quasi-dualist panpsychist, so I have trouble with angels, basically, <laughs> to fit in my panpsychism, yeah. Thank you very much. That was very interesting and illuminating. One thing you didn't mention, which I think is worth mentioning, that at least the modern versions of it have got a very deep empiricist roots. James, Russell, Eddington. And therefore, their understanding of mind, you used mind and psyche, is very much um, sensory consciousness. And though I might be able to see how my... Um, visual field is built up of little bits of the dots of consciousness of the quarks that make me, my thought that Manchester United is best and the Trinity is a good idea doesn't seem to be constructed in that way, whereas Russell had a behaviourist view of thinking and all that kind of thing. It's not clear how the intellectual and the primitive sensory are, are related. Uh, Galen Strauss and Philip Goff agree with those people that there are, um, um, what do we call it, um, consciousness of thinkings, <laughs> um, cognitive phenomenology, but they don't really explain how that fits into their, um, their panpsychism, it seems to me. And I think more needs thinking about that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that is... Um, well, the, you've, what you've pointed to is, in a sense, the combination problem, which is where all the effort... How do we get lots of the little... How can... When we're talking about the experience of the world, which seems so unitary... How can we build that up of little things? So that is where all the work in philosophy of panpsychism is being focused. It's it, no, it's not entirely that. I mean, there is the combination problem of how you get the quarks experiences made up into my, um, say, visual field. But it's even more difficult to see how it gets made up into the um, intellectual content of my thinking about things, which seems a completely different kind of creature. And that's something that the, the, the Russell, Strauss, and, and even Philip Goff thing doesn't really take into account, though they think that somehow that's part of the... <laughs> yeah, th they think that the bit you have to build in at the bottom is the experience, the, the ability to experience, so that there's something that, it, that it's like to be whatever the entity is. Um, that's, and once you've got that, they think you can build any other mental thing out of it. Um, and you might disagree with, with that, but that is the starting... Um, but what they could say is, so we talked about the subject panpsychist versus the pan protopsychist. So basically, whatever you think can't be built, you've got to put down in there in the beginning. So you could just get, this is the danger, you just get a more and more robust fundamental subject um, in order to account for that. Or you, you, some, you say, yeah, we can build thinking out of experiencing. But you're right, no one has figured out how we build it yet, otherwise... Oh my goodness, I hope humanity never figures that out, really, but um, <laughs> philosophically, I hope we do. But. Probably not quite necessary to use this in such a small room. But thank you. I really appreciated this talk, especially because you kind of stayed um, in introductory matters. Because I'm not an expert on the topic, so this might be a rather daft question. But towards the beginning of the talk, you indicated that... Um, Basically, panpsychism is, by definition, a distance or separate from substance dualism. And I, I'm just wondering, because when you described Leibniz to me, and I haven't read this part of Leibniz before, but it sounded very much like kind of Plato's sophist dialogue, right, of, of the idea of um, that, that um, sort of the, you know, the, the psyche is and the divine is in all things, and they all have an um, appetitive and, uh, well, in his case, contemplative, but I guess in, in Leibniz's case, um, perceptive, similar substance. But in Plato, of course, there's this kind of panpsychism, if we want to call it, and I know that, like, there is also pantheism in other dialogues of Plato, but in this case, it's, I, I think you could call it some panpsychism. It's very, it seems very much compatible with the substance dualism. Do you think that... Yeah, you're right. I should have been a bit more careful at the beginning there. So, um, so panpsychists typically want to differentiate themselves from physicalism, emergentism, Cartesian dualism. Maybe I should have said Cartesian dualism because... Um, I think it was maybe confusing, but I also said that you can interpret panpsychism as dualism all the way down. 
every, every, there's a dualism everywhere. It's not just us that's dualistic, um, which is what Descartes thought. Um, it's everything is, 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 is a dualism. Um, and so that would be, I presume, more like the position that you're outlining. And certainly, I think, um, it's a bit unsure whether, I don't know whether Leibniz is, is actually an idealist at the end of the day. I think he probably is, but um, yeah. So sort of instead of the Cartesian dualism of the soul, the me, and the rest of the world, the souls and everything, yeah. and the matter and everything, so right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of different substance, yeah, of you could say. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I had never heard of panpsychism before I heard about this today. Um, so thank you. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Um, the thing that talking about Spinoza made me think of was C.S. Lewis's discarded image, um, his view of medieval cosmology and theology of the universe being full of creatures of interesting things. Is this something we should be... <laughs> Revisiting. Did you mean Spinoza's or did you mean Leibniz's? Sorry, Leibniz's. Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, I always think, I love the discarded image, the book, and um, I always think we need to pay more attention to the medieval, to medieval science um, and to the medieval worldview, just mostly not because they were right about everything, but just because they were thought really carefully um, and have a lot to teach us and we neglect it. So um, in answer to the basic question of should we continue to consider this, yes. And I think... We do, I don't think we want to say that the whole universe is filled with animals, um, but, um, but to say that the whole universe is filled with minds is, is, is still a metaphys, I think it's still a, an option that's on the table metaphysically. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question uh, in the official, are there two, three, oh, no, I've got <laughs> Well, thanks very much. This, this should be quick. Um, I'm just wondering, in, in panpsychism, why suke is taken as mind, not nous. So it seems like suke ought to be kind of a forward thrust um, of life and nous the mentality. Um, to the extent that it is taken as mentality, on your view, does nature know God when it's praising God? Does it know what it's praising? Um... So um, my view for the last second half of your question, um, nature knows God in whatever way is appropriate for that bit of nature to know God. So uh, there's still gradients of mentality, of knowing or of experiencing. Um, so I do think, just to put it out there, I can't believe it's being recorded, I do think plants experience something of the world, right? They, they, there's, there's something going on and they're reacting to their environment and they're experiencing something, but I don't think they think. Right. Um, the more we learn about plant interaction, the crazier it gets. But I, I think at this moment, I'm happy to say I don't think they think. And so I don't think plants know and contemplate the Trinity. Um, but I think in, we can say they experience sunlight in some way. So might they experience God in some way. Right. Um, that would be my answer to that question. Okay, well, well, we'll have to stop there. It's a great one to get panpsychists on to. Do, 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 do plants experience? Philip Goff gets a bit edgy about this as well because he thinks it's yes, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry we didn't get in all of the questions, but thank you very much for your contributions. If you'd like to join me once again in thanking our speaker for a really interesting talk.